Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching. This video is sixth in a series of eight, presenting a note-by-note -note analysis of Wagner's Das Rheingold, Scene 2. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, its massive journey aspires to scan the entirety of Der Ring des Nibelungen to its final note. I hope you'll take this voyage with me when I'm dedicated to completing. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check out my preface video. Its link is supplied below along with those for the other videos preceding this one. We pick up where we left off in Dover's full score on the top stave of page 128 and the general reaction to Loge's panegyric. The immediate effect of his news is to set afire the minds of all its varied listeners, photons especially, each brooding on how this theft of the Rheingold might impact them. As befits their lowly status, the giants speak first, the sole moment when the brothers agree on anything. Ironically, while the king of the gods grumbles at Loge's perversity, the giants immediately grasp the fire sprite's implications, thanks to their own personal experiences. Fassel begins this colloquy by providing a broader look at the tale, whose tantalizing backstory no production has ever adequately explored. For one, he leaves no doubt the Nibelungs aren't confined to the Earth's depths as is generally assumed, an idea already bruited by Albert's seen one escape from Nibelheim into the Rhine. Fasold also speaks of unnamed conflicts, a shadow war prior to the events of Rheingold between the giants and Alberich. This elevates the dwarf to something more than the unexpected diversion he seems to be at first blush. More than just a narrative convenience, these peregrinations identify him and his race as ongoing players in the struggle to dominate this emergent world. The music of Fasold's meditation ropes towards defining that heightened influence, a passage that initiates the longest and most skillfully varied quasi-recitative in Rheingold, never mind all opera, one compactly leavened with developing syntax whose beginning hints at the riches to follow. The tremolo cello counterpoint to Fasold's words is especially interesting. While it never recurs as such, it seems to feel its way towards later syntax, its segments foreshadowing Goethe Dammerung's Hagen's Day melody, while also incorporating a series of four Welterb triads, its final portion, an embryonic version of the ring, its descending module, the fourth Welterb triad, and whose ascending half resembles a crabbed distortion of the treaty arpeggio. Just as noteworthy, the contrabass line incorporates a chord note opposition, which becomes pivotal in Alberich's scene three appearance. As the bass line elongates, it also suggests reverse melody notes, the overall module playing a key role in the scene two three interludes depiction of Alberich's burgeoning tyranny over his fellow Nibelungs. Launched with air accord notes, and after two static ash intervals, the first moving through a third bounce, the second begun with the rising air to fourth, Fasolt's vocal waxes rich in syntax as it approaches these particularly revealing orchestral modules to at last ride atop them. He intones a spear-like scale, plunges headfirst on a third into a low ash interval, whose rising interval is an ominous tritone. He then proceeds through a Welterb triad, this one's diminished minor echoed in the cello line, and including a reverse ash interval followed by two rising triads, whose final notes also invoke the Rhine Maiden's taunting. As has been said of earlier syntax, and which remains true for much more during Rheingold and beyond, there's no possibility an audience can separate out this hail of syntactic clues, even on multiple hearings. Instead, this text describes them to open a window onto the Meister's continual working through his sonic instincts, gradually hammering from them future syntax. In her diaries, Cosima Wagner recorded a conversation with her husband during the time he was completing Goethe Dameron, which is especially revealing in this context. 
Regarding a passage of my father's Faust symphony, R says he himself would have found it impossible to leave the accompaniment as it is, on the assumption that nobody would hear it and would notice only the melodic line. He had today spent a long time over one passage, he said. Not a soul will hear it, but that does not worry me and it is in things like that that the pleasure of working really lies. Aye, but one does hear it, at least one is aware of the richness in the work. As always, these lines hidden in the orchestral mix are remarkably consistent with Fassold's ruminations on the Nibelung's threat and the giant's response to them, a brief but telling snapshot of the world beyond Valhalla, and even the Rhine, where giants and Nibelungs freely interact over the course of untold years. Fafner's answer is curtly businesslike, his eye on the ills Albrecht might cause in the future, now that he's empowered by the gold. The tremolo cellos go on to concatenate the previous module into a pair of falling sevenths, which the giant doubles vocally, Erda goading him to revelation through Loge's manipulative craft, the first on a reverse ash interval. As cellos intone a last Welt Erb triad, Fafner sings a low ash interval on reverse chord notes, then rises a third to fall an air to fourth, ironically inverting that ringlust cell. A viola cello measure of Loges syntax confirms the fire sprite's covert part in this change of mind, even as it telegraphs the giant shift of focus to Loge, to whom Fafner calls gruffly by falling an a cappella third. After a quaver rest, he commands Photon's accomplice to speak, vocal bouncing down then up authoritative air de fourths, bracketing static notes, the whole reminiscent of Loge's panegyric coda, Fafner's concluding fourth on the words Ona Lug, which rises into chord notes, proof he trusts the fire sprite no more than do the gods, and for the very reason he knows Loge serves nature first. Surprisingly, the dull Fafner proves quicker than Votan, asking the gold secret outright with a closely echoing pair of lines. The first begins on a crib of the melody note's heroic conclusion, the second launched by a low ash interval on reverse chord notes, both his phrases ending in downward four-note scales eerily reminiscent of the panegyric's resignation. Supporting his vocal, cello viola cording inverts the contrabass chord note opposition of Fasolt's prior vocal, capped as Fafter falls silent by low strings sliding down the four note scale with its resemblance both to the spear and resignation. Loge willingly complies, given he's designed his panegyric to elicit precisely this question, one Votan seems either too haughty or ignorant to pursue. Over a syncopated horn timpani pulse, not surprisingly, a chain of static ash intervals, woodwinds gently sigh an altered portion of the Rhine Maiden syntax launched by its two unmistakable air accords. Though, as the English horn intones a trill appoggiatura, the morpheme's turn varies on a rising sixth, capped with chord notes, to echo the nymph's scene one ensemble, when they wonder where Albrecht can have spent his life ignorant of the gold. Loge's vocal follows the woodwind chords by rising a third, falling on chord notes, then taking the maiden's bounce, here rising a fourth, which he caps with a high ash interval on a third, surmounted by chord notes. After a crotchet rest, he then doubles the joy variant with its rising sixth and chord notes, deeming the gold a toy when in the pure waters. In answer, horns join woodwinds with a rising duo of playful, taunting strophes, their syncopation giving its rhythm a distinct, if still embryonic, nibelung flavor, whose bounce also amounts to three consecutive abandonment triads. Clarinet's horns immediately shift to an iteration of the original gentle embryonic major mode ring, and Loge's vocal descants this shape by rising a third into a hint of fate to leap up a low ash interval on a fourth with the embryonic ring's playful digression, followed by an ominous descending fifth 
both comprising the words Runden Reife, all capped by a third bounce. It should also be recalled this seemingly unimportant bounce includes two iterations of that still embryonic lusting module. This first mention of the ring eliciting that desire to those assembled nudges the mode into minor on the spot as Oboe's bassoons repeat its embryonic morphine, the fire god's descant following its initial sinking third. After a dotted minimum rest, he continues at a parallax to the syntax with a static ash interval, then rises to hold a crotchet quaver fourth and descend a quicker fifth. He continues, lifting a third to echo his immediately prior vocal pattern, though without its hint of fate, as he reveals the ring's Höchsten Macht, a phrase that dances atop the ring's bounce with its embryonic shadow of desire for this power. On his last word, Woodwinds breathe a ring pulse, similar to its second embryonic form, its minor seventh harmony solidified, then an odd evolution combining the seventh plunge of Loge's scheming with the Rhine Maiden's taunts to create a pair of abandonment triads reminiscent of Fassold's prior concerns about Alberich's slippery incursions into the world above Nibelheim. In the most obvious way, it's a succinct nod to the nymph's equally ruined hopes, as Loge assures Fafner the ring, Gewint dem Mana die Welt, vocal bouncing on thirds to then follow the woodwinds in another taunt, which supplies that vocal syncopation. However, and more subtly, he thus follows its last rising triad. Another fascinating intricacy is the horn descant preceding then overlapping the fire sprite's phrase, which twice rises a fifth into a Welterb triad. Something no audience likely notices, it still implies the Meister developing syntax to acquire huge importance in relation to this idea of winning the world. The definitive ring morphine follows as it fills almost two full measures of vocal silence, its wonted diminished minor seventh harmony ominous on clarinet's third bassoons, reinforced by English horn over a sinister octavo contrabass pedal. As the morphine reiterates, Wotan finally takes up the thought by musing on rumors he's heard of the gold's power. He says nothing of where he gets this news, and, as is so often the case, his remark conflicts with the myths. The dwarf Andvari divulges his ring's powers, limited to generation of more gold, only to Loki, who tells others of Andvari's attendant curse, and nothing more. As a mark of intense focus, Wotan begins his meditation on three static ash intervals, the first two eluded, the third interval's final note lingering on a minim, as the woodwinds conclude the ring morphine by concatenating its embryonic version's bounce into a third dip and reverse chord notes. This initiates a key change to E major, emphasizing the god's new line of thought, one whose syntax is especially notable. Breaking the orchestra into four staves clarifies its essential syntactic voices as they float the gods' deliberations. The lowest stave, a horn pedal and timpani roll, forms the ominous ground for three harmonically ascending ring iterations. On the top orchestral stave, trombones intone two strophes of the morphine's falling portion, meaning its fragment, the third of these sounding on third trumpet and first trombone, while the second stave's cellos complete each morphine pulse with extended versions of its rising line. In this way, the hard brass thrust the fragments into the fore, the rising scales muted velvety siren appeals. Into each of the fragment strophes, bass trumpet interjects static ash interval pulses in their Valhalla form, a strong inference the god already covets this power for his own. Important as are these details, one of the most revealing of them is their shift into the gentle major mode of the first ring transformation during the scene 1-2 interlude, which moves it towards Valhalla part 1. It's a sign Wotan imagines the ring's power can be used for good, in the sense of turn to his own ends. 
Solidifying that impression, its ringstrophes closely parallel the god's dreamy rumination on his Fortress's Wonders beginning scene too. His vocal is as syntactically edifying, strung throughout with world ash intervals in virtually all their incarnations, a high leaping up a third to descend a third into static notes capped with the words Rotor Glens, on a low lifting a fourth. After a double crotchet rest, which follows the brass's second ring fragment, full voice, he goes on with a more leisurely reverse interval on chord notes, dovetailed into a sinister inverted on a third, and, last of all, a second low on the same interval. This wealth of ash intervals leaves no doubt Photon contemplates further compromises of these natural forces. Two additional and related details, both cryptic, only yield their secrets as this first chapter nears its conclusion. The god's voice leaps up and down thirds, while his next phrase reverses that motion. The third seems to have less of an impact on the Meister's lapidary syntactic use of leaping intervals than do the more obvious second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and octave, yet its formative role as the cornerstone of all diatonic triads suggests it must be as meaningful as any of the rest, and Wagner later employs that connotation in a brief but vital module he prepares here, of which more is said at the time he drops the other shoe. Meanwhile, Wotan concludes his Ode to the Ring's power on a distinctive cell that falls a third and rises a heroic fifth. This module is born of Flosshilda's warning against Alberich, the dwarf seen one passion, and Flosshilda's cruelest defeat of that hope. It has recently informed Wotan's demand that Loge explain his long absence. It also sounds prominently in the Immortal's Dream for Valhalla, whose orchestral accompaniment foreshadows that of the passage currently under discussion. This module clearly plays a central role in the ring's power, whose full influence hits home only in scene four. In all events, no audience can miss the passage's overall suggestion of the Immortal's burgeoning greed for Alberich's bauble, never mind his reasons for wanting it. Photon falls silent while, as a period to his ideas, the sequence concludes on horns which extend by repeating the ring's final portion like a sweetly beckoning hand, albeit with its own bass trumpet Valhalla pulse, yet another echo of the god's earlier meditation. This draws in Fricka, next to be hypnotized by the ring's allure, as the meter shifts imperceptibly into triple. First clarinet solo crotchet sounds on the upbeat of the meditation's final measure. With the following measure, gentle string tremolos support its line, an unmistakable recollection of how domestic bliss is first orchestrated. Fricka's vocal broadly follows the first clarinet solo tracing that melody note juxtaposition with which Loge ends his panegyric in hopes of restoring the Rhine Maiden's rights, as she wonders if the gold can be worn for its beauty. While the clarinet intones crotchets and quavers, with only a single semi-quaver syncopation on its reverse melody notes, Fricka's doubling ascends on four low-ash intervals, all on reverse chord notes, and elided until they're all but homogenous, followed by a reverse melody note chord note opposition. Kitcher Schacht opine. Fricka, with her fixed ideas of reviving Wotan's flagging interest in her and keeping him from wandering, fails completely to see the threat produced by forging the ring. Yet it's Wotan and his male counterparts who mean to rule through the force of might, while Fricka remains committed to love, the only immortal to actively champion Freya with something resembling true empathy. Here, her first vocal phrase, with its melody note juxtaposition resembling that in the panegyric, evolves an ongoing thread whose echoes suggest a possible, if ultimately unsuccessful, way towards that goal, one she concludes by leaping up then down a sixth, followed by a static ash interval, then an extravagantly graced version of Flosshilda's heroic module. Like the nymph, her vain hope is to rescue nature's purity, which, to give Kitcher Schacht their due, is only possible thanks to her deliberate myopia of the ring's hidden dangers. 
This also accounts for her vocal muddying of world ash intervals, while clarifying only a static one with its Valhalla associations. Continued velvety string tremolos suggest Loge's answer, who barely conceals his delight at having snared both primary immortals. He passes through reverse melody notes on a reverse ash interval to rise a fourth on a low ash interval into a brief hint of fate. This syntactic evolution leads to another domestic bliss pulse, complete with falling seventh, while altering its reverse dash interval to a triplet turn not unlike his favor to Freya's morpheme during the launch of his panegyric, an innovation which adheres to domestic bliss for its duration. His voice moves on to follow the ongoing clarinet line as he dangles before the goddess her dearest wish, a faithful spouse, a thought he expands by describing alluring jewelry forged by dwarves, a reference Wagner derived from the mythic Freya's Riesingamen necklace. As the fire god makes this allusion to a static ash interval, the Nibelung tattoo emerges for the first time in virtually its definitive form. A skillful mix of his voice, woodwinds, second horn, and tremolo strings complete with baleful falling octaves in pizzicato second violins, which complex he ends vocally by falling a third, rising a sixth, and concluding on air to chord notes, a ghostly echo of Rhinemaiden syntax a variant with which a moment ago he's revealed the gold's power to the giants, its leaping sixth here echoing the one Fricka's only just voice in her heavily graced heroic strophe, and one which echoes back to the panegyric. This cell's roots are sunk in the Rhinebaden's taught for Albrecht's ignorance of the gold, whose central notes bear a striking resemblance to the emergent ringlust module, which, not coincidentally, plays a role in Fasolt's previous complaint against the dwarf, and whose resemblance to the Hagen's day morpheme in Götterdämmerung is equally intentional. Calming woodwinds, low strings slide out of this mixture in a single complex transition measure. Contrabasses, cellos trace reverse melody notes, doubled in bass clarinet and strongly opposed by tremolo first violin, viola, second clarinet melody notes, the underlying racial tensions driving these contradictory imperatives. Complicating the mix, English horn whispers a melody note juxtaposition truncated by air to chord note oppositions, an idea the first clarinet finishes at a parallax, the only module audience's ears are likely to grasp. These conflicting lines trigger a solo violin to sweetly intone Freya's sensuous first half, complete with its new minted chromatic triplet. Floated on pale oboe English French horn air accords, the solo violin follows with a pair of additional echoing strophes, not quite the Freya syntax, in that they're shaped as chromatic melody notes capped in eerie rising tritones. While this isn't substantial enough to be considered a morphine proper, its module does recur in Rheingold twice to recall this moment. Broadly hinting to Wotan, Fricke asks, Schmeicheld, whether her husband could win the ring, her vocal rising on melody notes to fall in a reverse ash interval on a major third, then lift in air to fourth. As everyone falls silent, the stage directions call for Wotan to seem the in einer zu stender wachsender Besauberung, during a subtly telling syntactic juxtaposition. The solo violin evaporates in a series of trill appoggiature, paradoxically on a rising triad, echoed at a parallax by first clarinet an octave third below, with its sly load of abandonment and betrayal. For the moment, so fascinated by the gold they think only of it, the gods have lost interest in Freya's rescue, and it should be noted the love goddess has absolutely nothing to add vocally to this extended passage during which every other character on stage has something to say. The Divisi Violin Choir descends from the heights on a group of tremolo chords supplemented by high woodwinds. 
While this juxtaposition doesn't precisely mirror Air to Twilight, it's near enough to leave no question this is a dangerous moment. The godly tribe balanced on a moral cliff edge. Beneath its falling line, first trumpet sighs a Rheingold fanfare, echoed on the spot by first horn, which furtively alters its harmony to minor mode. As Wotan begins his vocal, violins pass down two ring fragments into violas, which hand it to cellos, the progressively ominous figure doubled by sostenuto woodwinds, the whole passing it through a light tonal spectrum into its darkest, a soft timpani roll joining at the second fragment, which ends as bassoons stress air to chord notes. The god's vocal, his first overt statement coveting the ring, stealthily perverts his own more noble syntax, as it intones a sort of backward static ash interval, reversing its pulse to short long short. He then eschews that same rhythm in what would otherwise have been a low ash interval through a rising fourth, an era reminder of renunciation, as he falls a poignant sixth. From this, after a crotchet rest, he moves into a Weltherb triad, echoing the orchestra's ring fragment, then briefly redeems himself by rising on melody notes, only to finish with a damning tritone, the two details producing chagrin. A pair of syntactic innovations in this passage is also its most covert. The first is the falling triad in Wotan's vocal, as it follows the orchestra's second and darkest ring fragment. Together with the other sinister implications, there's a sense the god already formulates in his mind ways of exploiting the ring's power, while continuing to nurse the same nation racial urge building an Alberich. Syntactically, these hints only coalesce into recognizable morphemes once both god and dwarf have lost the ring. Yet their intimations continue to pulse throughout Rheingold as these two enemies learn more of the ring, its ability to transform the life around it, and how their own powers might be honed by it. In short, the enchantment Photon experiences here is the result of mulling the ring's potential in which he gropes towards a path that can maintain even Burgeon his world control. The second detail resides in its initial trill appoggiature. Their ascent is actually a reversal of the ring fragment, meaning they include not one but two abandonment triads, Still more ominous, this fragment reversal is destined to play a key syntactic role in the god's downfall. But of that, more when it definitively manifests. Finally, and most subtle of all, Wotan's last phrase is nearly identical to that with which a few minutes earlier he chastises the fire god for pleading the Ride Maiden's case, one which nudges the immortal towards the very outcome his chancy friend desires. Meanwhile, Loge has all his listeners in the palm of his hand, which is his intent from the moment he arrives. Now, point by point, he leads his willing audience of immortals and giants through the steps necessary to fatally embroil themselves with the ring by their own hands. It's worth noting that at no time does the fire god ever drop so much as a hint of any dangers involved with the bauble, but it takes care to stress only its allure and the difficulties of acquiring it. True, Alberich hasn't yet cursed it, but it's ineffective to claim on that account it doesn't yet pose a threat. In Shaw's words, The ruin to which the pursuit of riches leads needs no curse to explain it. As a primal force of nature, Loge knows the risks intimately. It has still gone to much trouble arranging both that it should come into being and that the god should covet it. He's even gulled Fricka, who, as a nature deity like himself and Erda, is the only one of the crew with sufficient insight or authority to mount valid objections, helpless Freya having been shoved to the periphery long since. Before Wotan's consort might even voice a caveat, Loge has driven all such thoughts from her mind. Of the assembled gods, Freya alone says nothing. It's a revealing omission, especially given the direction the conversation heads. When Loge reveals the condition attached to forging the ring, one would expect at least a comment from the goddess of love. 
but Freya is the single most underrepresented character in Rheingold, with a total of eight lines only, whose combined word count is smaller even than Erda's mere three lines. This might not be notable if Freya's comments were as pithy as the Earth Mother's, but the love goddess is restricted either to cries for help or grieving moans over her sad state. Then again, this is the Meister's deliberate comment on the neglect love suffers in this first chapter of his epic, a situation which doesn't change until Valkyr, and then only equivocally. Photon at last rises to the bait, asking the fire god how this ring can be obtained, atop bassoons, cellos, alternately and ominously sighing two erdachords in their most baleful minor mode harmony, a shivery measure of timpani roll beneath the second chord of their first pulse. With this complex, his vocal falls through chord notes, then after a quaver rest and a tritone ascent, leaps down a sixth on Loge's name, reminding how that interval's mildness has only just gulled Fricka. The father god continues with Flosshilda's insidious heroic figure, which, though still embryonic, routinely telegraphs resistance to adversity. After sliding down more chord notes, Votan concludes with a pair of ash intervals, the first a rare high on a tritone, the second low on a third, the two separated by another falling sixth, identical to the last. In answer, three quaver contrabass thumps punctuate a chilling cymbal roll, which extends through two ring strophes on low woodwinds, as the fire god explains rune magic is necessary, his vocal after a tritone ascent, again outlining the Veltab triad at the ring fragment's core, shaped by a pair of reverse ash intervals followed by a low, and finished on that distinctive lusting down-up interval leap with which Photon concludes his own musing on the ring's power, its final interval on Loge's lips, a prescient seventh. Photon, after all, is the one the fire god most needs to snare. After a dotted minim rest, Loge reports of this magic that keiner kennt ihn, although Alberic clearly does. The fire god's vocal rises through a low ash interval on reverse chord notes as the tempo shifts to common time. He then falls an ominous fifth, announcing renunciation, which sounds in woeful low brass strings very much as when Velgunde first introduces it. The fire god's vocal descants the complete morpheme's gloomy march, as he tells the immortals just what the nymph told Alberich, rising in a low ash interval on an air to fourth, then plunging with the same interval, which he caps by doubling the orchestra's first renunciation pulse on its reverse melody notes. To finish, he precisely outlines the morpheme's second pulse, his news returning the tempo to triple time, and a nervous, rising, diminished minor seventh twitch on contrabass cello-viola chord bundles. This builds swiftly on three static ash intervals in their most truncated Valhalla form, a weird, frantic ghost of the Erda melody, suggesting Wotan's displeasure, which the stage directions ask him to exhibit by gesture. Pleased by his boss's discomfiture, each phrase punctuated by marcato viola cello quaver chords, Loge amuses himself a cappella on a plunging sixth and rising third, a retrograde of Wotan's lusting module. The fire sprite mocks the god's irritation, as well as that nascent module's sense of lust for the ring. After quaver rest, Loget smugly reports Alberich's beaten the tardy immortal to the deed, his vocal and inverted ash interval on reverse melody notes, and following another crutch at rest, another and especially dire inverted on a falling octave to the name Alberich, capped with Flosshilda's heroic defiance. Two loud string quaver cards with rushing upward graces, a growing nibelung hallmark, preface Loge as he reveals what this bad news means. A single ring strophe, entirely on strings, for the first time unashamedly models its rising notes into six in number, thus completing earlier tendencies in opposing the spear. 
Loge follows the ring's outline vocally, along with its extended scale, yet another syntactic detail growing ever more indicative as the epic continues. This leads to three nervous, sequentially higher repetitions of the Ring Fragment's Welterb Triad, a module which has only just played a part in Wotan's vaguely solidifying impressions of the Ring's potential for clinching his world control. To reinforce this emergent concept, the low string line sandwiches this Veltelb module between a pair of its rising oppositions, with their sense of betrayal. In conclusion, woodwind horns sweep away the strings in a thoroughly tragic iteration of resignation's downward scale, doubled in the orchestra and Loge's vocal. This is anything but chance noodling. For one, a minor detail only visible by close examination of the score, Resignation's first half, meaning its initial three reverse melody notes, sounds on horns sustained by clarinets, yet opposed in English horn by the notes proper, in their natural rising incarnation. It's only after this opposition ends, one becoming progressively more syntactically meaningful as the work progresses, that resignation trails away pathetically on clarinets alone. More importantly, the unnatural falling rising sign of the ring corrected into a natural rising falling sign by the descending line of resignation is already foreshadowed in Fassold's outrage over the god's duplicity, a structural contour that's played a subtle role several times since, particularly in the form of this ring resignation module. Its repetitions increase, especially during the latter part of the tetralogy, one of those composite morphemes whose nature Cook is first to explore, though he doesn't mention this one. Finally, the insidious repetitions of the Welterb triad, not the first time they'll sound in this way, hint powerfully at Albarech's burgeoning racial designs. This is a moment of intense introspection, one the god will not have again until nearly the end of Rheingold. Here he considers the roots of his lust for power, what he'll risk to satisfy it, the obstacles that gratification faces weighed against its ultimate value. The story's remainder, at least Wotan's involvement in it, hinges on this moment and its vital syntactic associations with its unequivocal confirmation of Albrecht as the current sole master of the ring's power. Comparing the types of world order in Rheingold, Kitcher Schacht opine, Wotan came to the spring, and the world ash already in quest, already in the grip of the problem of how to create a grander order, a world in which the rhythms of primordial natures have been superseded by the rule of law. Like most commentators, they pay little attention to Erda, which leads them to ignore a detail this analysis deems particularly germane at this moment. Wotan's theft of the World Ash branch may be in order to establish what most analysts take for the rule of law, but that theft is in itself a breach of natural law, and as Fassel points out to him, the immortal's attempt to defraud the giants also violates the basic principles of the very law he's purportedly sought to inaugurate. Volkan comes to this turning point, therefore, with his own grand idea for the world already compromised. He may be searching for a way to satisfy the giant's claims, but one can't help think that to regain the upper hand in this situation, never mind all future ones, the immortal is more than ready to entertain further compromises of his original high aims. In the end, it's far less the rule of law Wotan seeks to establish than the rule of his own power by whatever means. The passage under consideration embodies these ideas in musical syntax, juxtaposing the ring's falling, rising sign with the falling one. Another of its syntactic innovations is its three back-to-back Welter -back triads echoing the ring fragment, which form the last portion of the down-up module's rising segment. At this point, the only solid import one can assign these cells is their close relationship to Alberich's mastery of that fearful talisman, and the god's fascination with the power it brings. Only the future can reveal its further significance. 
Both the passage's text and the resignation syntax completing it, however, suggest some deep interconnection between this power lust and the renunciation of love. Beyond that, we must await further details, which are certainly forthcoming. And here we must leave things until the next video, which picks up where this one leaves off in Dover's full score on the first stave of page 134. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.